Hey there, everybody. It is Friday of Holy Week. Good Friday. But it's also the third week of our national quarantine. Now, during this quarantine, Dano and I and our staff have found ways to remain incredibly, incredibly busy. But I have spent a little bit more time than I usually would at home. And this last weekend, kind of feeling guilty about the fact that I had done really nothing constructive with my time at home. I, I sir came and I decided I was going to clean out the desk in my upstairs den. I only got through one drawer. But along the way, as I was going through that drawer, I found an object that if I had my own private Smithsonian Institution, this would be in its own case because this is something that held a whole lot of significance for me for a short period of my life. It's right here. And it is just a little black notebook. Contrary to what the name might suggest, this is not my little black book that would contain the uh, names and telephone numbers of former girlfriends. No, I promise you that book would be a lot thinner than this one is. But instead, this book had something to do with an intense time in my life when I was pledging a fraternity at Valparaiso University. I graduated from high school in 1978, a long time ago. And when I did, my father, who had gone to IU and who was a fraternity member at IU, and who years later I found out almost flunked out of college because he was a fraternity member at IU, two things that I was about to make a family tradition. But anyway, my dad came to me and he said, Mark, he said, when you get on campus, you're going to have to make a decision about whether or not you join a fraternity. And that's going to be up to you. But he said, I want you to be really careful if you do decide to join a fraternity because you don't want to get in with the wrong bunch of guys. If you get in with the wrong bunch of guys, you're going to find yourself with a group of guys that want to party instead of study or go after women instead of study or play sports instead of study. And I remember when my dad said that, I was amazed because he'd hit at, on four of the most important things in my life at that point. And that is playing sports, going to parties, uh, talking to women, and not studying. And so it was in the spring of 1979 that I found myself as a pledge at Sigma Tau Gamma Fraternity at Valparaiso. Now, if you don't know much about fraternities, if all you know about them is from the media and what you see, you might assume that fraternities are just sort of Neanderthal places where pseudo-adolescents do socially uh, repugnant things. And I can't speak for all fraternities, but for my fraternity, that's pretty well accurate. <laughs> Actually, my fraternity was a great place and I learned a lot there. But what you may not know is there are two kinds of people in a fraternity. One is an active member, that's somebody who's earned his way in. And the other is a pledge, that's somebody who's trying to earn his way in. And you, tr you earn your way in, at least we did, through a variety of really, well, in retrospect, pretty silly things. You had to memorize all this really bizarre stuff. I remember I had to memorize how to recite the Greek alphabet backwards. Not only that, but you also had to do a lot of stuff. You had to earn your way in through what you did. I remember having to uh, clean, a, clean a fraternity brother's room and all kinds of really bizarre rituals like when one fraternity brother entered the, uh, your room you had to stand up and hop on one foot. But most of all you tried to earn your way into the fraternity through your little black book. See all this was was a blank notebook and this was where they could write down your merits and demerits. A merit was when somebody caught you doing something good or you were right about something they could ask for your black book and they'd tear off a page and they would write an unknown number of merits on it and then they would turn it into the fraternity president. And that would be great. But for me, it usually went the opposite way. When I was messing up or when I got something wrong, they would ask for my black book, tear off a page, write down a number of demerits, they, they never told you how much they were, and they would turn that in. Now all those merits and demerits really mattered because you knew at the end of pledging there came something called Hell Night. And at the end of Hell Night, 
there was something that they called the Great Reckoning. That's when the fraternity president would total up the number of merits versus demerits that you had. And if you had more merits and demerits, you'd earn your way in. If you had more demerits and merits, well, they didn't really tell you about that, but you knew something bad was going to happen. The problem is you never knew exactly where you stood. However, in my case, I had this sinking feeling that I was going to be on the wrong side of that equation. Well, I lived through pledging, and at the end came hell night where they kept you up all night doing all these silly kinds of tests and things. But we were all holding our breath because we knew at the end there was going to come this great reckoning. Now, I'll never forget, about 5 o'clock in the morning, we were in the basement of our fraternity, and they asked us all suddenly to stand in a circle. And they said the time had arrived. And at that point, the president of the fraternity walked into the middle of that circle, and honestly, he looked at us, and he raised up his hands, and he said, It's finished. You've all made it in. And at that point, two things occurred to us. The first was the fact that all of those merits and demerits, they'd never been turned in to begin with. It was all just a con. They'd thrown them away. But the other thing is that we were accepted in. No matter where you are in the merits or the demerits list, we were somehow all accepted in. You and I were created in a garden simply to love and be loved. It's that simple. That's what God asked us to do, but we turned away from God. God has never rejected us. We rejected God. We walked away. We walked away from peace, and we found stress. We walked away from acceptance, and we found loneliness. So we decided that we would reapproach God. Not that God would approach us, but we would approach God and we would do it on our own terms. We decided that we would try to earn our way back into God's favor. And that's where religion was born. We tried to earn our way back into God's favor by doing all of these rituals. By Jesus' day, there were about 63 different sacrifices that you had to do. We would earn God's favor by knowing all the right stuff. But more than anything else, we would try to earn God's favor by being good people or doing good things, somehow hoping against hope that we would get God merits, but all the while knowing somehow sinkingly that our demerits on that list might just overweigh whatever good we had done. And God knew that that wasn't a plan that was going to work. So instead of us reapproaching God, He reapproached us in Christ to do for us what we could never do for ourselves, to go beyond the merits and the demerits, to go beyond what we could ever deserve, and to pay the price for us. And at that moment of hell night or hell day, suspended between heaven and earth on a cross, Jesus raised his hands and he said, It is finished. If you look that up in the Bible commentaries, they'll tell you that what Jesus was saying was that his earthly life had finished. But I think it's a lot more than that. In that moment, what was finished was the system of our trying to earn our way into God's favor. What was finished was the shame and the guilt. What's finished was all of the merits and demerits that never had mattered in the first place because on the cross, God threw away all of the merits and demerits and unreasonably, illogically invited us in. That's what the cross was about. That's what this day is about. No longer is it about us being good enough, because honestly, we never could be. It's not about our earning our way anywhere. It's simply about what God did for us in Christ on that cross. 
And when Christ raised his hands and he said, it's finished. He was looking down through time at you and me. And he was inviting us in. No longer do we have to be strangers to God. But we are invited in by the, by the outrageous grace of a God who throws away the merits and demerits and invites us home. That's what the cross was all about. As bloody and terrible as that moment was, the cross is an invitation home. An invitation home to acceptance and love and peace where God doesn't have to be a stranger anymore. Where loneliness never has to matter again. Where there is a purpose and a meaning to life. All because of that moment when God himself raised his hands and said, it is finished. The merits and the demerits don't matter anymore.